two Trumps, Istragon and Vladimir, waiting for Godot on a godforsaken place, or should we say Godot for second place. They meet Lucky, the slave, and Pozo, his master. They interact, converse, in short, spend the time. Nothing happens. A boy comes, informs them that Godot would not come that day and would be there the next day. The boy departs, they stay, curtain falls. So what are we going to expect from Act 2? Expect. Did I say this play is about disappointments? So let's find out in this video how Beckett is going to disappoint our expectations in many different ways again and how he leaves a very remarkable hint as to whether the condition of Istragon and Vladimir is going to be worse or better at the end of the second act of this play. The setting is next day, same place. How do we know it's the next day? Because Beckett says so in the stage directions, all right. We see Istragon's boots. Uh, which boots? The boots which he had left there. Now, from the point of view of the audience, we can recognize the scene and we can recognize the boots, all right? And then we can see the tree. Lucky's hat is also there. Remember Lucky's hat, which uh, helped him think. The tree is a bit different here. The tree has four or five leaves. Enter Vladimir agitated. He is uh, very tensed and agitated at this moment. He halts and looks along at the tree. Then suddenly begins to move feverishly about the stage. Now he kind of gives off an air as if he is expecting something to happen or he is not happy with the situation he is in. And he tries to give off a sense of action here. All right. He uh, looks at the boots, picks one of them, examines it and all. Finally, he starts to sing loudly. And what does he sing? He sings a very strange song. A dog came in and then he starts at a very high pitch, which he feels he cannot continue. And then he begins again. A dog came in the kitchen and stole a crust of bread, then cook up with a ladle and beat him till he was dead. Then all the dogs came running and dug the dog a tomb and then he forgets probably the lines and he thinks and he starts again. Then all the dogs came running and dug the dog a tomb and rode upon the tombstone for the eyes of dogs to come. So this is a very peculiar song. Of course, it doesn't have uh, much for its theme other than the theme of mortality, death, is talking about death of a dog. The strange thing about this song is it has a cyclical pattern. He keeps on repeating it. There's a refrain. And this is uh, usually the, the style of the drinking songs, uh, which were uh, pretty famous, especially uh, in uh, around Germans and French people. And Beckett had these kind of first-hand experience, especially during his uh, resistance years. The song goes on. And finally, uh, well, he ends, he stops, broods, resumes. Then all the dogs came running and dug the dog a tomb. He stops, broods softly and dug the dog a tomb. Is his memory failing? Of course, uh, memory is something which is very problematic in this play. We cannot hold on to anybody's memory. Now, why is memory important, especially in plot constructions of any play? Plot builds upon events and especially if you follow Aristotle's um, theories you would see that plot involves a lot of flashback and these techniques involve memories of characters. Characters talk about their past, what has happened to them and they reach an anagnosis, a, a kind of a knowledge about where they went wrong. Now how do we know that we have committed a mistake. If we have a knowledge about our past actions and we understand a kind of causality that something which we have done has caused something in our lives. But if memory fails, then we will not have any chance of any anagnosis, any self-knowledge, any kind of, you can say, epiphany as Joyce would call it. Vladimir is not showing a very sharp memory here. He remains silent, motionless, and then again he is feverish. He comes before the tree and then looks at the tree and then Istragon enters. He is barefoot, his head is bowed. He is barefoot because his boots are on the stage, right? Remember? 
Vladimir is pretty happy to see Istragon here. You again! Istragon is not responding with enthusiasm. Come here till I embrace you. Don't touch me! We see a kind of coldness in Istragon. We don't know why. Vladimir holds back paint. He is feeling heartbroken. Do you want me to go away? Go, go? Did they beat you? See the same conversation, the same kind of questions and we are almost expecting the same kinds of answers here. Go, go. Where did you spend the night? Don't touch me. Don't question me. Don't speak to me. Stay with me. He doesn't want him to go. He just doesn't want him to ask him questions. Why? Because these kinds of questions are again going to uh, somehow trigger his memories which he clearly doesn't have much. Did I ever leave you? You let me go. Now when Istragon was entering the stage, uh, he must have heard Vladimir singing and he must have thought that this man appears to be pretty happy. He is singing and I am not with him. So maybe he enjoys when he is not with me. And this is the kind of sentiments which you know lovers have. We don't usually have friends that much emotionally connected to each other. But here Istragon is uh, pretty upset that Vladimir has a good time uh, when he is not around. Look at me. Will you look at me? So Vladimir is trying to uh, understand what's wrong with Istragon. And then very similar to the way you know couples make up, they embrace each other and Istragon says, what a day. Who beat you? Tell me. Another day done with. So he's avoiding answering. Not yet. The day is not over yet. For me, it's over and done with no matter what happens. I heard you singing. That's right. I remember. That finished me. I said to myself, he is all alone. He thinks I'm gone forever and he sings. See, he's kind of being a little envious maybe. One is not master of one's moods. All day I have felt in great form. I didn't get up in the night, not once. Now we know that Vladimir has this uh, problem uh, with urinating. So when he says that he didn't get up once in the night too, he had an undisturbed sleep. It means that he was feeling well. You see, you piss better when I'm not there. These kinds of humor, they were not approved by especially British audience who had this unusual high regard for decency and they even wanted this play to be banned. But this is what Beckett is giving us. He's giving us a real picture here. People do talk about these things when they are together, when friends are together. So he is not trying to polish their conversations. He's trying to give us what it actually means to talk to your friends and do. And these words are pretty common among friends. I missed you and at the same time I was happy. Isn't that a strange thing? So it's a duality he is talking about. Happy? Perhaps it's not quite the right word. And now? Now! There you are again. There we are again. There I am again. So note the change and Beckett notes these changes. You know, first he writes the word joyous, then he says indifferent and then he says gloomy. So Vladimir is quickly shifting from one mood to another. You see, you feel worse when I'm with you. I feel better alone too. So this is what happens with them, both of them. They contemplate leaving each other every time and then they keep coming back into each other. Then why do you always come crawling back? I don't know. No, but I do. It's because you don't know how to defend yourself. I wouldn't have let them beat you. You couldn't have stopped them. Why not? There was 10 of them. No, I mean before they beat you, I would have stopped you from doing whatever it was you were doing. Vladimir always has this idea that he is the more sane one, he is the more practical person. So he would have stopped his struggle from doing something which he did unintentionally and because of that he got beaten up. I wasn't doing anything. Then why did they beat you? I don't know. Now he struggled. well his memory fails miserably. Ah, no, Gogo. The truth is, there are things that escape you that don't escape me. You must feel it yourself. So he's pretty patronizing here. I tell you, I wasn't doing anything. Perhaps you weren't. But it's the way of doing it that counts. The way of doing it, if you want to go on living. Maybe you were 
doing something in a particular way that was wrong. We don't know what they are talking about, what we struggle and must have done. But who said that they are going to give us any information at all? Istragon goes on telling that he has not done anything. You must be happy too, deep down, if you only knew it. Happy about what? To be back with me again. Would you say so? Say you are, even if it's not true. Speech has such an impact on our minds that Vladimir wants Istragon to say it out loud that he is happy with Vladimir. And he feels that once he says it, it will be materialized. What am I to say? Say I am happy. I am happy. So am I. So am I. We are happy. We are happy. What do we do now? Now that we are happy. <laughs> so this whole thing about happiness is shown to be such, a, such an overhyped thing. Uh, we give such a lot of importance to you know, being happy. Uh, we have these uh, statistics where we try to determine which nation is the happiest nation. But happiness is all about how you look at your situation. It's about your attitude to your situation. And Istragon is saying that just because we are saying we are happy doesn't make us happy because we do not know what to do now, now that we are happy. Wait for Godo. Istragon groans. So he's, he's not happy about it. Things have changed here since yesterday. Has it changed? Same conversation, same place, same almost everything except for one thing. Istragon is going on talking about Godo if he doesn't come. We'll see when the time comes. I was saying that things have changed here since yesterday. Everything oozes. For Istragon, things have changed. In a way, uh, a wound becomes worse over time. It starts to ooze. It starts to get infected. Okay. And smell comes out. So, Istragon is feeling like change means going from better to worse. Look at the tree. So, Vladimir is trying to show change as a positive thing. And Istragon is trying to say that things have become worse. It's never the same pulse from one second to the next. So he's talking about festering of wounds. The tree, look at the tree. Now Istragon looks at the tree. Was it not there yesterday? So Istragon does not understand what change has come about the tree. We know there are leaves now. Not so many leaves, but some four to five leaves. Yes, of course it was there. Do you not remember? We nearly hanged ourselves from it. But you wouldn't. Do you not remember? You dreamed it. So, Istragon is trying to deny whatever Vladimir is saying. And clearly, Istragon has trouble remembering what has happened the previous day. We know. We are the audience. We have seen it on stage. But Istragon doesn't remember anything. Now, here I want to pause and try to understand this whole idea of uh, memory, of experience uh, in terms of the philosophical thoughts which must have uh, influenced Beckett in a way. Now, so far as the philosophical influencers on Beckett is concerned, uh, I am not talking about the immediate ones or the contemporary ones. He was more in tune with the ideas of Descartes who was a deeply logical and mathematical thinker. There are much opposition to the ideas of Descartes, but the one which I want to talk to you about is his idea of experience. Experience according to him might be actually false. Uh, they might be dreams, a delusion you can say brought about uh, by an evil demon who delights in tricking us. Beckett's characters often show this Cartesian attitude. You know, they detach themselves from their pains and emotions as if they belong to the world of dreams. So, Istragon's idea that uh, everything that Vladimir is saying is something which he must have dreamt reinforces this idea. Again, you remember one thing, whenever Istragon wants to 
talk about his dreams whenever he is falling asleep, dozing off, having a dream, getting up and trying to tell Vladimir about it, Vladimir does not want to hear his dreams. Because see dreams are those tricks that demons play on our minds and the experiences we have in our lifetime, they are also dreamlike, they are not real. Pretty dense I know but Istragon's uh, seemingly innocent comment brings to mind Descartes' idea about experience and the connection with the demonic dreams. You can look up this from Dermond Moran's essay, Beckett and Philosophy, very good one I came across. Is it possible you have forgotten already? That's the way I am, either I forget immediately or I never forget. And Pozo and Lucky, have you forgotten them too? Pozo and Lucky, he's forgotten everything. Who is Vladimir talking to? The audience? He wants validation? Is he getting insecure that his memory might not be as good as he's thinking it to be? Probably he's looking at the audience and saying he has forgotten everything. Please help us. I remember a lunatic who kicked the shins of me. Then he played the fool. He's talking about Lucky. That was Lucky. I remember that. But when was it? And his keeper, do you not remember him? He gave me a bone. That was Pozo. So, Istragon remembers in terms of physical experiences he has had. He has had this kick from Lucky, the bone which he chewed on. So, he is more physical in his uh, association of experience with uh, memory. Uh, but in Vladimir, we have more like uh, a, a logical sequence still reflected. Okay, He remembers events. Istragon remembers experience. That was Pozo. And all that was yesterday, you say? So, Istragon always looks up to Vladimir for any kind of information which he surely lacks. Yes, of course, it was yesterday. Now, from the perspective of the audience, this becomes very unsettling. The audience begin to ask themselves, okay, are we sure it was yesterday? So, the notions of time and place, which is very essential when it comes to stage play or audience's idea about a particular location where the characters are actually standing, that notion is hit hard here. And here where we are now, so not just time but the place also is questioned here. Where else do you think? Do you not recognize the place? Recognize? What is there to recognize? All my lousy life, I've crawled about in the mud and you talk to me about scenery? Look at this muck heap, I've never stirred from it. Now, suddenly Istragon is getting angry. Now, I clearly see a very distinct difference between the Istragon we have seen in the first act and the Istragon we are seeing now in the beginning of the second act. That Istragon was very jolly. Uh, he had an innocent uh, humor about him. He was pretty happy with little things. And this Istragon is clearly very depressed. And it's like he has had enough. Like how can there be this change overnight? So is this really only a gap of one day we are looking at? Because Istrogon has clearly become a very different personality here. Calm yourself, calm yourself. You and your landscapes. Tell me about the worms. And then Vladimir tries to make him remember their old days, you know, when they used to spend time picking grapes. Istrogon doesn't remember much, like not anything. You're a hard man to get on with, Gogo. It'll be better if we parted. You always say that and you always come crawling back. The best thing would be to kill me like the other. Has Vladimir killed somebody? And Istragon is referring to that other person. Vladimir also catches on this sentence. What other? What other? Which other person have I killed that I'm going to kill you now? Istragon suddenly universalizes the whole thing. Now he doesn't talk about one specific person but people who are killed, like he's talking about mass murders here. 
like billions of others. So, it's generalizing and yes, the shadow of the world war uh, broods over Beckett's lines here. To every man his little cross till he dies and is forgotten. So, Vladimir is also philosophical here because he is also uh, reflecting on the massacre that the world has faced in recent past. In the meantime, let us try and converse calmly since we are incapable of keeping silent. Speech has always been used by human beings as a way to communicate. This I have told since the first line we have had into this play. But here it is only a means to pass time. Speech has lost its importance. So, somehow speech which connects people is becoming just a facade, the kind of a mask you wear to actually hide what you are thinking. You are right, we are inexhaustible. It is so, we won't think. We have that excuse. It is so, we won't hear. We have our reasons. All the dead voices. So, this recurrence of catastrophe. He cannot come out of that feeling that people are being killed and they can't do anything about it. So, Estragon might not have a very strong memory or immediate memory, but he has this sensitivity to general human suffering which was going on all around them at that moment. They make a noise like wings, the dead voices, people who have been killed mercilessly. Like leaves, like sand, like leaves. So, see, Estragon's imagery is fixed. And when somebody is so fixed in their imagery, we can be more sure about that person's honesty. It's as if Estragon is really hearing the dead people's voices and they are like leaves. Now, this is very interesting because what do we associate leaves with? Leaves are associated with life. This tree which now has leaves shows us a promise which the tree in the first act did not show us. So, leaves naturally bring to us this idea of rejuvenation, spring, uh, renewal. But here he is associating the voice of the dead people with the rustling of leaves. They all speak at once, each one to itself, silence. Rather they whisper, they rustle. See, his imagery is constantly referring to the leaves. He's talking about rustling. They murmur, they rustle. It's almost becoming like poetry. What do they say, the dead people? They talk about their lives. To have lived is not enough for them. They have to talk about it. To be dead is not enough for them. It is not sufficient. They make a noise like feathers, like leaves. See, Estragon is stuck in his imagery, in his metaphor, you can say, or simile. Like ashes, like leaves. So, Estragon is using a refrain here, you can say, leaves and rustle. Uh, the tree assumes a new meaning, the tree which has now leaves on them. Say something, I am trying. Say anything at all. What do we do now? Wait for Godo. It is like a trigger question. Ah, this is awful. Sing something. No, no, we could start all over again perhaps. Now Vladimir wants to restart their conversation. He doesn't want to sing. And while we have seen Vladimir pretty sure of himself earlier, now he is actually asking Istragon to help him. And he says, help me. I'm trying. When you seek, you hear. This is also having some biblical echo because in Bible you have this expression that you seek and then you find the truth. Then they go on having these short uh, conversations about thinking, about questioning each other, about contradicting each other. And finally, when they are really uh, sick and tired of finding a topic to talk about, Estragon uh, tries to say, we should turn resolutely towards nature. But 
it is not possible to go back to nature like the romantics did because the world war was already there and nature was clearly not capable of providing human beings the sustenance it did uh, in the beginning of 19th century. The conversation goes on along the same lines when finally Vladimir says, yes, but now we'll have to find something else. Let me see. He takes off his hat, concentrates. So Istragon is wearing a hat, he takes it off. Vladimir takes off his hat and there's this long silence. Ah, they put on their hats. Now in earlier act, we had seen that when Lucky was wearing the hat, he was thinking. Well, we don't call that thinking, but it was believed that Lucky would be able to think once he wears his hat. So hat in a way represents thought, in a way represents identity. Uh, no wonder Vladimir keeps on opening his hat and looking into it as if he's searching for something, he's searching for his own self in there. And Vladimir then tries to summarize the events of the evening and he comes to the topic of the tree again. Okay. Wait, we embraced, we were happy, happy. Uh, what do we do now that we are happy? Go on waiting, waiting, let me think, it's coming. Um, go on waiting. So he's really, you know, stressing himself to remember what has happened 15 minutes back. Now that we are happy, let me see. Ah, the tree. So he tries to hold on to the strings of conversation they had so that they could have a continuity. Because in this play, what we lack is a continuity. Somebody begins a topic and that topic completely changes and everybody forgets everything. That's the main problem here. We don't have a chain of conversation. We don't have a stream of consciousness here. Tree, do you not remember? I'm tired. Look at it. They look at the tree. I see nothing. But yesterday evening it was all black and bare and now it's covered with leaves. It's not covered with leaves. There are only four or five leaves probably there. Leaves? In a single night? It must be the spring. But in a single night? So now Vladimir who was insisting that they were here the previous day is now questioning whether they were actually there the previous day because it's not possible for a tree to grow leaves overnight. I tell you, we weren't here yesterday, another of your nightmares. And where were we yesterday evening according to you? How would I know? In another compartment as if we are living life, journeying on a huge train and we pass from one compartment to the other. So it's all the same, everything is same, the layout is same, the speed of journey is same. And that train is probably going on in a circular motion. So there is no end to this journey. And there is no way to know which compartment we have been in. Because all look similar. And then he says a very important word. There is no lack of void. So there is a direct reference to nothingness. That existential crisis you can say. That we are in a void. So if we are in a void, how to know... Uh, any difference between one kind of void and the other kind of void. So how does it matter if we were here or not? Because we didn't get what we want yesterday, we are not going to get what we want today. So it doesn't really matter whether it's the same place or not, the same tree or not. Good. We weren't here yesterday evening. Now what did we do yesterday evening? Do. Try and remember. Do. I suppose we blathered. About what? Oh, this and that, I suppose. Nothing in particular. Yes, now I remember. Yesterday evening, we spent blathering about nothing in particular. That's been going on now for half a century. So repetitive life without purpose or uh, vitality, that is what defines their life. You don't remember any fact, any circumstance, like something on which we can pin down our experience. Don't torment me, did he? So he is very tired. The sun, the moon, do you not remember? 
they must have been there as usual. So when you refer to uh, objects like the sun and the moon which are very celestial large things uh, which are not actually directly uh, related to your life experience then you cannot prove anything because sun moon they are independent of your life. So you have to prove the validity of your life with respect to something which happens in connection with your life. Not the sun and the moon, that is what Istragon is trying to say here. You didn't notice anything out of the ordinary? Alas. And Podzo and Lucky? Podzo. The bones? They were like fish bones. So, again, because Vladimir is talking about the experience which Istragon had, so he can remember. It was Podzo gave them to you? I don't know. And the kick? That's right, someone gave me a kick. It was Lucky gave it to you. And all that was yesterday. Doubting everything there was to doubt. That was the crux of Descartes' philosophy. Doubting everything. And that is what we see in Estragon. He's doubting everything. Show me your leg. Which? Both. Pull up your trousers. Why is he trying to look at Istragon's leg because he wants to see whether there is a wound or not because Lucky had kicked him there. And look at the way Vladimir is instructing him. The other, Istragon gives the same leg. The other pig, you remember? Pozo was using the same kind of tone when he was talking to Lucky. He was using pig, uh, fool, all these kinds of words. Vladimir is doing the same. So he is kind of uh, sounding like Pozo here. It's as if consciousness is like a sponge which takes up everything it gathers over time. And from hearing this expression, the other pig, we feel relieved that yes, Pozo actually did come. Otherwise, why would Vladimir speak the way Pozo was speaking? Okay, so this is how speech is validating experience. Okay, And what about it? What are your boots? I must have thrown them away. When? I don't know. Why? I don't know why I don't know. No, I mean why did you throw them away? Because they were hurting me. There they are. Now they look at the boots which are lying there. They are not mine. See, He does not want to prove that they were here the previous day. Why? Why is he struggling so vehemently trying to disprove the fact that they could possibly be here. Not yours. Mine were black. These are brown. You are sure yours were black? Oh, well, they were kind of grey. And these are brown. Show me. Well, they are kind of green. Nothing is certain here. Show me. Istragon hands him the boot. Vladimir inspects it, throws it down angrily. Well, of all the... You see, all that's a lot of bloody... Ah, I see what it is. Yes, I see what's happened. Now, Vladimir, who always wants to logically explain everything, wants to logically explain how Istragon's boots have changed color. It's elementary. It's very simple. Now, it's elementary is something you associate with Sherlock Holmes. He used to say this a lot of times. Someone came and took yours and left you his. So, human beings always try to deduce something or have knowledge through induction. Uh, logic is something human beings cannot avoid. They love logic and Vladimir is doing exactly that. So someone must have come, seen Istragon's boots, tried them and that someone must have taken the boots of Istragon away, leaving his behind because his boots were not fitting him. His were too tight for him so he took yours but mine were too tight. Now Istragon feels that he had tight boots means that boot was tight for everybody. Istragon has never shown much of cunning or intelligence to us yet. For you, not for him. I'm tired. Let's go. We can't. Why not? We're waiting for Godo. What will we do? What will we do? There's nothing we can do. But I can't go on like this. Would you like a radish? See, repetitions. He offers him again and... Istragon uh, wants carrots. Vladimir doesn't have carrots. Then give me a radish. 
he doesn't get radishes he gets only turnips finally he gets a radish and Istragon feels that he is not happy with this radish because this radish is black and he only likes pink radishes. Istragon gives it back. I'll go and get a carrot as if he's actually going to go to the market. But he doesn't go because we know we, they will not be going anywhere. This is becoming really insignificant. What is insignificant? There standing here together is insignificant. Why? Because it is not leading to any positive conclusion. That's why it is insignificant without any importance. What about trying them? Now that they have this ample amount of time when they are not going to do anything, so they are uh, you know, devising plans to pass the time. And Vladimir wants Istragon to try the boots. I mean the boots. Now if Istragon immediately went and tried the boots, then they would have nothing else to do. So Istragon wants to prolong this trying of boots by first talking about things. What is he talking about? You will help me. I will of course. We don't manage too badly, Edidi, between the two of us. Now we have such a cordial tone in him. Yes, yes, come on. We'll try the left first. We always find something, eh, Didi, to give us the impression we exist. Human beings need to do things because otherwise they will start questioning whether they exist or not. Now, there are these two uh, philosophical schools, we can say. One which says, I see, therefore I am. Essa est percipi, that is. Uh, the Lockean philosophy and there is the, the Cartian philosophy which says that uh, I think therefore I am. Here they are saying I do therefore I am. So they are reinventing a new kind of philosophical thought here and they are departing from that idea of empiricism which says that I am feeling things which means I am existing and from this uh, school of logical thinkers who feel that uh, well I can think, I can reason therefore I exist. Here they are saying we exist only because we do some things. So action becomes the uh, validation for existence here. Yes, yes we are magicians but let us persevere in what we have resolved before we forget. Come on, give me a foot. So uh, he has uh, that boot in his hand. He wants uh, Istragon to try it and then he again uh, expresses himself in the way Pozzo would have. The other hog, higher, try and walk. So now Istragon is going to try the boots and he says it fits. So this is a very insignificant thing, you know, two people on stage, what are they doing? They are trying boots. Uh, the audience must have felt really stupid staring at them thinking that what am I looking at? And they were very angry, especially if they were sophisticated theatre goers. Finally, this episode ends when Istragon has tried both boots, feels that he is pretty comfortable in them. He sits down. That's where you were sitting yesterday evening. If I could only sleep. Yesterday you slept. I'll try. Now he resumes his fetal posture, his head between his knees. Fetal posture means the kind of posture or position which a baby takes inside the mother's womb as a fetus. Why is this posture important? Because Istragon is trying to take this posture as if he wants to have some security. Uh, and this posture gives a kind of mental peace to make you feel as if you are inside your mother's womb which was the most secure and happy place uh, before you were born. So that kind of uh, an enactment is seen on stage. Wait and Vladimir makes a very uh, heartwarming gesture here and he starts to sing kind of a lullaby. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye. Not so loud. Then Vladimir says, bye-bye, bye-bye. So he's trying to make Istragon fall asleep. And this creates a kind of an effect on the audience 
who appreciate somehow that there is this peculiar bond between the two. And uh, here Vladimir assumes the role of a mother, uh, of a parental figure as a protective persona, you know, kind of watching over Istragon. But then we feel that is he strong enough to protect Istragon? Is he secure? Like is he himself not under duress here? And then Istragon is sleeping, Vladimir is walking about and suddenly Istragon starts. You know, it just happens when we sleep, suddenly we dream that we are falling and then we start up. Vladimir comes and comforts him. There, there, it is there, don't be afraid. Ah, oh, there, there, it's all over. I was falling. It's all over, it's all over. I was on top of a... Don't tell me. See, Vladimir does not want to hear Istragon's dreams ever. We'll walk it off. He takes Istragon by the arm and walks him up and down until Istragon refuses to go any further. That's enough, I'm tired. You'd rather be stuck there doing nothing? Yes, please yourself. Let's go. We can't. We know what's going to happen now. Why not? We are waiting for Godo. Ah, can you not stay still? I'm cold. We came too soon. I think our appointment is uh, supposed to be a bit late. We are early here. It's always at nightfall. But night doesn't fall. It will fall all of a sudden, like yesterday. Then it will be night and we can go. So Vladimir is saying that when there will be night, they will be going away. Why? Because subconsciously he knows that Godo will not come. That tonight also they will leave without meeting Godo. Then it will be day again. What will we do? What will we do? Will you stop whining? I have had about my belly full of your lamentations. I'm going. Now Vladimir sees Lucky's hat. Well, farewell. Lucky's hat. I've been here an hour and never saw it. Fine. You'll never see me again. So Istragon is talking about going away. Vladimir is talking about Lucky's hat. They are so disconnected at this moment. I knew it was the right place. Now, Lucky's hat is acting as a marker here, um, which makes this place an authentic one. See, the sun, the moon, they are not linked to them directly. But Lucky's hat is linked to the experience they've had yesterday. And so it is proved that they were here yesterday. So this is the place, okay? Must have been a very fine hat. He puts it on in place of his own which he hands to Istragon. So now there will be a peculiar juggling of hats. Let's follow it closely. He puts on Lucky's hat and then he gives Istragon his own hat. What? Hold that. Istragon takes Vladimir's hat. Vladimir adjusts Lucky's hat on his head. Istragon puts on Vladimir's hat in place of his own. Istragon was also wearing a hat. So he opens his hat, places Vladimir's hat. So he has his hat in his hand, Istragon's hat, which he passes to Vladimir's hand. Vladimir, who was wearing Lucky's hat, again replaces it with Istragon's hat. Hats, we know, are connected to identities. Like earlier, we have uh, talking about that. So when they were wearing each other's hats, were they assuming each other's identities or the swift flow of one hat uh, from one head to the other shows that identities also have become kind of uniform here. They do not differ from each other much. And in a very robotic fashion, this goes on like we see a, a juggling trick in front of our eyes. Okay, these hats shifting uh, uh, through their heads. Finally, after this long exchange, what do we have at the end? Vladimir adjusts Lucky's hat on his head. Istragon is at this moment holding Vladimir's hat in his hand. Okay. And gives it back to Vladimir. Vladimir takes his hat, which was originally Vladimir's hat. 
hands it back to Istragon, who takes it and hands it back to Vladimir. So they are not putting Vladimir's hat on their heads at all. And finally, when Vladimir's original hat reaches Vladimir's hand, he throws it down. So Lucky's hat is on Vladimir's head now. On Istragon's head, we have Istragon's hat. Okay. So you can say a symbolic exchange of thought here, hat thought analogy, I think therefore I am, okay. So when Vladimir asks whether Lucky's hat fits him, Istragon says, how would I know? No, but how do I look in it? So he does like this, like a mannequin, hideous. Yes, but not more so than usual. Like I do look hideous all the time. I look horrible all the time. I know that's my facial feature. But do I look worse in this hat? Neither more nor less. Then I can keep it. Mine irked me. So I had itches when I was wearing my hat. How shall I say? It itched me. He takes off Lucky's hat, peers into it, shakes it, knocks on the crown, puts it on again. So he's trying to do to Lucky's hat whatever he uh, was doing to his own hat. So he's trying to personalize Lucky's hat by these actions, you know, looking, peering, knocking, wearing it again. I'm going. Will you not play? Play at what? We could play at Pudzo and Lucky. So now they want to do a performance. Earlier in previous act, we have seen Pozzo performing, Lucky performing. So now they want to perform, rather Vladimir wants to perform and he wants to be lucky. So eventually when Istragon is convinced that they should play uh, the part of Pozzo and Lucky and Vladimir would be lucky because he is wearing Lucky's hat and Istragon would be Pozzo. Uh, Istragon has completely forgotten uh, how Pozzo talked. So Vladimir instructs him, tell me to think. What? Say think pig. Think pig. Vladimir is waiting. He can't think. I can't. Descartes is failing here. He can't think. So if he can't think, does he not exist? That's enough of that. Tell me to dance. I'm going. Mr. Gon is clearly bored. Dance, hog. So he instructs himself and starts riding. Go, go. So, Istragon is already leaving. So, he calls back. Istragon comes back. As if somebody has chased him. So, he's coming back panting excitedly. Hastens towards Vladimir, falls into his arms. There you are again at last. I am accursed. Where were you? I thought you were gone forever. They are coming. Who? I don't know. How many? I don't know. It's Godo. At last. Go, go. It's Godo. We are saved. Let's go and meet him. He drags his struggle. He's excited. He, he knows that this evening is going to be fruitful after all. Istragon is not very keen on meeting Godo. He is here because he is waiting for Godo. But the moment there is a possibility that Godo might be here, he is trying to resist. Pulls himself free. Exit right. Go, go. Come back. Enter his struggle right. Hastens towards Vladimir. Falls into his arm. There you are again. Again. I'm in hell. Where were you? They're coming there too. So, whoever was coming from the left exit is also coming from the right exit. We are surrounded. Imbecile. There's no way out there. There. Not a soul in sight of you. Go quick. Istragon is clearly horror struck. And then finally Vladimir says, Your only hope left is to disappear. Where? Behind the tree. Quick, behind the tree. But the tree is so narrow. You can't actually hide behind it. Decidedly, this tree will not have been the slightest use to us. Istragon is a bit calmer now. And he's saying that, okay, tell me. Like nobody has entered the stage threatening them. So he's feeling calm and he wants to do something. Vladimir doesn't know what he should do. You go and stand there. There, don't move and watch out. So they, they're watching out for people who might be coming. They are expecting Godo, of course. And they're at the same time dreading the moment if Godo came. 
And then Vladimir after some time feels that Istragon must have had a vision, like there was nobody there. And after some time they have this peculiar fit of cursing each other. And as a part of their conversation they start to abuse each other. Istragon actually says, that's the idea, let's abuse each other. They turn, move apart, turn again, face each other as if they are uh, standing like two people are about to dwell. Uh, about to fight and they will fight with words. Moron, vermin, abortion, morpion, sewer rat, curate, cretin, critic. And when Istragon says critic, Vladimir feels defeated because nobody can be as bad as a critic. Imagine literary critics sitting in the first row of the audience. How would they feel about it? Oh, he wills vanquished and turns away. Now let's make it up. Go, go, Didi, your hand, take it. Come to my arms, your arms, my breast. Off we go, they embrace, they separate, silence. So it's all like play acting. They are fighting each other, they are embracing each other and if their fight is not real, their embrace is probably also not real. It's all a show. How time flies when one has fun. Unhappiness is in a way so comic. What do we do now? While waiting? Very important. Usually, whenever they have this question, whoever asks this question that what do we do now? The answer is either nothing or wait for Godot. Here he is already anticipating that they will be waiting and he says while waiting. While waiting, we could do our exercises. So they are constantly devising plans to pass the time. Are they weird? Well, that would make all of us weird. We are all devising plans to pass the time till we actually die. And they plan on taking up these exercise postures. We are not in shape. What about a little deep breathing? So a direct reference to uh, Indian yoga system of breathing. I'm tired breathing. Let's just do the tree for the balance. And then while Istragon is almost in a yogic posture, he suddenly feels uh, religious because he says, do you think God sees me? So there is this necessity for validation here again. Necessity for a witness, preferably God. You must close your eyes. Istragon closes his eyes, staggers, because when you close your eyes and you don't have much of a balance in your feet, then you will stagger. God, have pity on me. And me? We know that one of the thieves was saved. So the moment Istragon is saying, God have pity on me, Vladimir also wants to add himself to the count that I should also be considered. On me, on me, pity, on me. Only one thief was saved, remember this. Now enters Podzo and Lucky. And as audience, we remember how Podzo is, how Lucky is. And we recognize them. But we do not recognize them uh, by the way they looked and behaved in the previous act. It is just a similarity uh, which is faintly visible. Pozzo is clearly changed. Let's see how. Pozzo is blind. Lucky burdened as before. Lucky situation has not changed much. Rope as before but much shorter. Why? Because Pozzo now needs to be guided by Lucky. Lucky wearing a different hat. At the sight of Vladimir and Istragon, he stops short. Podzo continuing on his way bumps into him. Go, go! So Vladimir looks at them and recognizes them. Now, Lucky has stopped. Podzo is blind, so he cannot see Lucky stopping. And he bumps against Lucky and says, What is it? Who is it? Lucky falls by the impact of Podzo hitting him. And Pozzo also falls. And this will go on for a long time. Lucky and Pozzo lying on the stage 
not able to get up that will be going on for a long time now. Estragon wants to know if this is Godot or not. Earlier in the previous act also he confused Ponzo with Godot and here he is asking the same question is it Godot? At last reinforcements at last reinforcement of what? Reinforcement of activities reinforcement of devices that would help them pass the time. So it's as if these uh, plans we have of passing time, these plans are like weapons and when we run short of uh, ammunition, reinforcement comes means now these people have arrived, now we will have something to do at least while we wait. Help, for Zoe is screaming for help. Is it Godo? We were beginning to weaken. Now we are sure to see the evening out. Now we will no, have no trouble you know, to pass time because we will have entertainment. Help! Do you hear him? We are no longer alone, waiting for the night, waiting for Godo, waiting for... Waiting. All evening we have struggled, unassisted. Now it's over. It's already tomorrow. So he is so happy. It's as if, you know, arrival of Pozzo is giving him a fresh hope that now he will not feel that much of a despair waiting for Godot because he will be uh, having a kind of diversion. So what is happiness? Happiness is the diversion we have because otherwise life would be a monotonous journey towards the end. Time flows again already, the sun will set, the moon rise and we away from here. Pity, Pozzo is going on talking here. Poor Pozzo. Now, what would you think if you were the person watching the scene? You would think that why aren't they helping Pozzo get up? For the same reason, they didn't try the boot at once. If they help Pozzo at once, then Pozzo will leave at once. And then what would they do for the rest of the evening? So they want to prolong this whole thing. And in the course of prolonging this whole thing, they are postponing helping Pozzo. And they will talk a lot before they manage to help Pozzo up. Let's see what they talk about. I knew it was him. Istragon is still believing that it might be Godo. That it might be Godo. Who? Godo. But it's not Godo. It's not Godo. It's not Godo. Then who is it? It's Pozzo. Here, here, help me up. He can't get up. Let's go. We can't. Why not? We are waiting for Godo. Ah, perhaps he has another bone for you. Bone. So Vladimir wants Istragon to help Pozzo because then Pozzo might give him a bone. Chicken, do you not remember? It was him? Yes. Ask him. Perhaps we should help him first. To do what? Now Istragon clearly is seeing that Pozzo is lying on the ground. So when Vladimir says that we should help him, Istragon cannot even figure out that the way to help this guy is to pick him up. So he's asking what to do? To get up. He can't get up. He wants to get up. Then let him get up. He can't. Why not? I don't know. Pozzo rise. No, we are also feeling that why can't Pozzo get up? He's blind. He's not lame. Uh, he's not on a wheelchair that he can't get up on his own. He is blind. He can easily get up. Lucky can easily get up. But they are not getting up. We should ask him for the bone first. Then if he refuses, we will leave him there. You mean we have him at our mercy? Yes. And that we should subordinate our good offices to certain conditions? Good offices means our helping. So the instinct of helping should be controlled by these conditions. What? That seems intelligent all right, but there is one thing I am afraid of. What? That Lucky might get going all of a sudden, then we would be balanced. Lucky? The one that went for you yesterday? So he is apprehensive of reaction from Lucky. Lucky might start kicking them, biting them if they go to help. Istragon has again forgotten the episode about Lucky. And then Vladimir figures out that they should actually help Pozzo. And why? Why is that? Istragon is asking him. 
we help him in anticipation of some tangible return. It's like salvation in exchange for good deeds. And suppose he, let us not waste our time in idle discourse. Let us do something while we have the chance. It is not every day that we are needed, not indeed that we personally are needed. Others would meet the case equally well, if not better. To all mankind, they were addressed. Those cries for help still ringing in our ears. But at this place, at this moment of time, all mankind is us, whether we like it or not. Let us make the most of it before it is too late. This is what major philosophical schools tell us. That we need to be what we can be in this lifetime because we don't have eternity. And that idea is reflected here. Let us represent worthily for once the foul brood to which a cruel fate consigned us. What do you say? Istragon says nothing. It is true that when with folded arms we weigh the pros and cons, we are no less a credit to our species. The tiger bounds to help of his congeners without the least reflection or else he slinks away into the depths of the thickets. So wild animals, they act on impulse. Our impulse is to help and at the same time, our impulse is to reason out helping. But that is not the question. What are we doing here? That is the question. And we are blessed in this. This we happen to know the answer. Yes, in this immense confusion, one thing alone is clear. We are waiting for Godot to come. We thought he was talking about helping Bozo. He's actually talking about waiting for Godot. Ah, help. Or for night to fall. So, Either we will have Godo or we will have the night. 50% chance again. We have kept our appointment and that's an end to that. We are not saints, but we have kept our appointment. How many people can boast as much? Parable of the ten virgins. A direct reference to that. What is the story? It is uh, found in Matthew 25.1. Um, it's a story told by Jesus Christ. To illustrate the importance of being ready for his return. And what was this story? That uh, there is this bridegroom for whom 10 virgins will be waiting as bridesmaid. And there would be a procession in which the bridesmaids will carry the torches. Now out of the 10 bridesmaids, 5 kept some extra oil because they felt that it might be a bit late, so their torches should remain uh, intact, lighted. And five bridesmaids did not have extra oil. So when finally the time for the arrival of the bridegroom came, the five virgins who had that extra oil, they could have their torches lit up and they could join the procession, whereas the ones who did not have the extra oil, they were left behind. So this extra oil is the extra faith you must have on God and the bride is the church, you can say, of Jesus. And Jesus here, of course, is the bridegroom. So Vladimir is talking about keeping the appointment. Vladimir is talking about having that extra faith. That extra faith that he has, which has helped him come back to this place again and again. And every time awaiting a positive response from Godo. So, so many biblical associations then. That must have been a reason why many people think that Godo is like a representation of Godhead, divinity. And then he goes on to say, all I know is that the hours are long under these conditions and constrain us to beguile them with proceedings. So hours are long and he has to beguile the hours. Where have you heard this word beguile? In Macbeth. To beguile the time, look like the time. Remember how Lady Macbeth was convincing Macbeth? Here Vladimir says that whatever he does is, whatever, whatever acts he uh, engages in, they are 
performances to beguile the time, the hours. And this performance becomes a habit. You may say it is to prevent our reason from foundering, no doubt. But has it not long been straying in the night without end of the abysmal depths? That's what I sometimes wonder. You follow my reasoning? Now, Estragon clearly has a very low IQ and he doesn't want to be confused with so many words. And he says, uh, we are all born mad, some remain so. So, does he want to mean that Vladimir is mad now? Help, I'll pay you. How much? 100 francs. It's not enough. I wouldn't go so far as that. So, Vladimir said that I think we should take this money. You think it's enough? No, I mean so far as to assert that I was weak in the head when I came into the world. But that is not the question. See, Vladimir is not actually responding to the immediate question. He is talking about whatever he was talking about in the past. 200. So, Pozzo goes on uh, bargaining for his help. We wait. We are bored. So, they are completely disregarding Pozzo here. No, don't protest. We are bored to death. There is no denying it. Good. A diversion comes along. So, Pozzo for them is a diversion. A diversion comes along and what do we do? We let it go to waste. Come, let's get to work. So, he goes towards the heap where Pozzo and Lucky have fallen. In an instant, all will vanish and we'll be alone once more in the midst of nothingness. He knows that the moment he helps Pozzo, Pozzo will leave. But then, since this is the only thing he can do now, he will do now. We are coming. He tries to pull Pozzo. Well, false. So, now instead of two people, we have three people heaped on the floor. Istragon comes. There's another argument. Istragon pulls, stumbles, falls. All fallen. Basic human condition. We see humanity fallen down completely. Like if four of them represent four different kinds of human beings or classes of human beings, you can say. All have fallen down. And while being together there, Pozo is asking them questions. Who are you? We are men. That's why they are fallen. Sweet Mother Earth. Can you get up? I don't know. Try. Not now, not now. Istragon has actually gone off to sleep, perhaps. That's what he does. What happened? Will you stop it? You pest. He can think of nothing but himself. What about a little snooze and sleep a little? And he goes off to sleep. After some time, Istragon has started up again. What is it? Were you asleep? I must have been. It's this bastard Pozzo at it again. Make him stop it. Kick him in the crotch. Will you stop it, crab louse? Now, probably he kicks Pozzo. Pozzo is crying out. So, the audience cannot figure out who is doing what. Somebody is kicking the other person and they are all in this huge heap of bodies. And instead of helping each other, they are making things worse for each other. What do we do now? Perhaps I could crawl to him. Don't leave me. They are all lying down now. Okay. And then Istragon starts to call him by some names. What would be amusing to try him with other names one after the other. It would pass the time. See. Lying there in that uncomfortable position, they are still thinking about ways to pass the time. And we'd be bound to hit on the right one sooner or later. I tell you, his name is Pozzo. We'll soon see. Abel, Abel. Who is Abel? Abel and Cain, they were two children of Adam and Eve. Abel was a very uh, sweet guy and he was... Uh, you know, always engaged in offering sacrifices. He offered the best sheep he had to God and God was always very pleased with him. Cain was envious because Cain's sacrifices were not accepted uh, like Abel's were. Uh, and his jealousy grew and he ended up murdering Abel. He was the first murderer and because of which God punished him and turned him into a fugitive who would... Uh, 
never find salvation. So that's the story of Cain and Abel. So Abel is kind of a representative of eternal good man who is a, the eternal victim. He calls Pozzo as the Abel. Now Abel was also the one who was saved. Cain was the one who was damned. So there also we have a 50% chance of salvation. Help got it in one. I begin to weary of this motif. Vladimir is bored. Perhaps the other is called Cain. So he thinks that Lucky's name is Cain. He is all humanity. So if one is Abel and the other one is Cain, they represent the entire human race. Look at the little cloud. Now they are lying down looking up so now they can see the sky and there are clouds there. What is so wonderful about it? Let's pass on now to something else. Do you mind? I was just going to suggest it. So now they want to change their topic. But to what? Suppose we got up to begin with. Okay, let's get up. So they get up. Child's play. Simple question of willpower. So till now they were not getting up. Why? Because somehow getting up was also pointless. What would they do after they get up? So they were not getting up. And now they think that that's the only thing they have to do. So they get up. And after getting up, they have the next thing to do that is uh, to help Podzo. Istragon again asks the same question. Why doesn't he get up? Vladimir says he wants us to help him. Then why do we, don't we? What are we waiting for? And this time... They help Pozzo to his feet, let him go, he falls again. Again they pick him up, somehow they support him better this time. And Pozzo asks the same question, who are you? Do you not recognize us? I am blind. Perhaps he can see into the future. Why? Because in many cultures we have stories where blind people become prophets and seers. Uh, you know about Tiresias, because if you are blind, you are gifted with these sights about the future. So they feel that now Pozzo can see the future. Since when? I used to have wonderful sight. But are you friends? This might have two meanings. One is, are you friends of each other? Or are you friends to me? He wants to know if we are friends. No, he means friends of his. Well, we proved we are by helping him. So, they are having these short uh, words exchanged between each other. Pozzo first felt that they could have been highwaymen, um, robbers. But now he sees they are not robbers. And Pozzo somehow wants them to stay with him for some time. Don't leave me. No question of it for the moment. What time is it? Pozzo had always been obsessed about time. We know that. He really panicked when his watch was missing in the previous act. Vladimir and Istragon, they don't carry watches. They just look at the sky and they try to guess 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. That depends what time of year it is. Is it evening? Now they're looking at the sunset. And they make a very interesting observation. Istragon looks at the sun and says it's rising. So if you are not sure whether uh, direction is east or west, uh, then the sun looks similar when it is rising and setting. You want to know whether it's morning or night. Impossible. Perhaps it's a dawn. Don't be a fool. It's the west over there. How do you know? Is it evening? Anyway, it hasn't moved. What hasn't moved? The sun? I tell you, it's rising. Why don't you answer me? Give us a chance. It's evening, sir. It's evening. Night is drawing nigh. My friend here would have me doubt it and I must confess he shook me for a moment. But it is not for nothing I have lived through this long day and I can assure you it is very near the end of its repertory. How do you feel now? So they are still supporting Pozzo. And then they ask about his sight and he says that he used to have this wonderful sight. And when Istragon wants uh, him to explain Vladimir says, leave him alone. Can't you see his thinking of the days when he was happy? Memoria preteritorum bonorum. Memory of past happiness. See, I was telling you about memory and how it helps us 
uh, create link between our present existence and our past. Uh, and then we have this idea of happiness as a continuity when we have memory. And Pozzo has memory, they don't have memory. We wouldn't know because we don't have memories. And it came on you all of a sudden, quite wonderful. I'm asking you if it came on, of, on you all of a sudden. I woke up one fine day as blind as fortune. Sometimes I wonder if I'm not still asleep. And when was that? I don't know. But no later than yesterday. Don't question me. The blind have no notion of time. The things of time are hidden from them too. Then they describe the place. He asks about his slave that oh, what has happened to my slave? I don't know. He seems to be sleeping. Perhaps he's dead. What happened exactly? Exactly. The two of you slipped and they tell what happened till now. And then strangely, uh, after they also help Lucky get up, Vladimir asks a very important question. What is there in the bag? So Lucky gets up, he holds his bags. Uh, strangely, when uh, he has fallen down and he first tries to get up, uh, he falls down again and he is able to stay erect even in his bent position only when he's carrying his burden. So that is kind of giving him kind of a strength, you can say purpose. So purpose, even if it is a burden, helps you survive, helps you go on, move on. What is there in the bag? Sand. Lucky is carrying sand. And sand is strangely connected, not just to time, but to place. How to time? You have our glass and in our glass you have sand dripping down, defining time. Sand makes up the earth in a way, okay? So it defines space, it creates place. So time and place are both represented by the word sand and lucky carries sand in his bag. So time and place are burdens that Lucky carry. But does he possess them? We don't know that. Pozzo wants to leave. They wish him to stay because then if Pozzo leaves, they will be bored again. They ask Pozzo if Lucky could sing. To sing, yes, or to think or to recite, but he is dumb. So the change has not affected just Pozzo, it has affected Lucky as well. Pozzo has become blind, Lucky has become mute, he cannot speak, okay. Dumb, he cannot even groan. Dumb since when? Have you not done tormenting me with your accursed time? It's abominable. When, when, one day, is that not enough for you? One day he went dumb, one day I went blind, one day we'll go deaf, one day we were born, one day we shall die, the same day, the same second, is that not enough for you? They give birth astride of a grave, the light gleams an instant, then it's night once more. Beautiful line. Coming from Bozo, since we know him to be a shallow person, we are uncertain whether to see the statement or take this statement as a sincere one. But in itself, this is huge. He means that the moment we are born, we are given birth right beside a grave. The moment we are born, our journey towards death begins. It's as if on the same day, everything is determined. So Pozzo in a way represents determinism, where no matter what happens, you are actually walking towards death. So unlike Istragon and Vladimir, who they are very, very uh, ill-fated. I know they, are, they don't get to meet Godo, but they have this reason to go on. Pozzo doesn't have a reason to go on. He has this idea that it doesn't matter because I am born only to die. That's the only reality I can have in my life. 
on he goes out vladimir follows them to the edge of the stage looks after them vladimir goes towards his strogon his strogon has fallen asleep again why will you never let me sleep i felt lonely i was dreaming i was happy that passed the time i was dreaming that don't tell me he doesn't want to hear his dreams i wondered is he really blind blind oh now every time istragon falls asleep he forgets what was happening immediately before podzo blind he told us he was blind important point here how do we know podzo was not lying well what about it it seemed to me he saw us you dreamt it let's go we can't ah are you sure it wasn't him who godo but who podzo so again he wants to know if there was a possibility that podzo was godo not at all no first he says in a very confident way not at all and then he is less sure not at all not at all so he is doubting himself again i suppose i might as well get up oh didi i don't know what to think any more my feet help me so again istragon is having some pain or the other vladimir is going on thinking about istragon's words here istragon had said that you had a dream so he says was i sleeping while the others suffered am i sleeping now tomorrow when i wake or think i do what shall i say of today that with istragon my friend at this place until the fall of night i waited for godo that podzo passed with his career that he spoke to us probably but in all that what truth will there be because if it was a dream it is not true istragon is struggling with his boots and he dozes off again vladimir looks at him he'll know nothing he'll tell me about the blows he received and i'll give him a carrot a stride of a grave and a difficult bird down in the hole lingeringly the grave digger puts on the forceps during birth if it's a difficult birth the surgeon he needs to put forceps and plug the baby out of the womb it's as if it's not a birth that is happening as if those forceps are there inserted by the grave digger who will directly put the child into the grave because that is what life is a passage from womb to grave we have time to grow old the air is full of our cries but habit is a great deadener what is habit habit is pretending to pass the time games that people play to pass the time and that deadens our senses he looks again at his dragon at me too someone is looking who is looking at him okay the audience is looking at him god is looking at him is he a believer then does he have that extra oil will he be saved and is dragon damned of me too someone is saying he is sleeping he knows nothing let him sleep on i can't go on what have i said he goes feverishly to and fro finally at extreme left broods now the boy comes in so when the boy comes in istragon is sleeping vladimir does not wake istragon up be very careful pay close attention to this conversation now mr mr albert off we go again so this has been going on in a cycle every time do you not recognize me no sir it wasn't you came yesterday no sir this is your first time yes sir do you have a message from mr godo yes sir vladimir only says the message he doesn't wait for the boy to tell the message to him he won't come this evening no sir but he'll come tomorrow yes sir without fail yes sir did you meet anyone no sir two other men i didn't see anyone sir 
What does he do, Mr. Godo? Do you hear me? Yes, sir. Well, he does nothing, sir. How is your brother? He is sick, sir. So, if this boy had not come to them the previous day, then this boy is the brother who gets beaten. Now, you remember that boy who had come in the first act. What had he said? He said that he minds the goat and his brother minds the sheep. Now, in Christian belief, sheep represents Christ, goats represent Satan in a way that, you know, uh, satanic cults, they have these figure of goats worshipped. Therefore, we can say that there is a possibility that one boy is the Christ figure and one boy is the Satan figure. There is again this pairing where one is saved and the other is, well, damned. Now, this whole analogy works if you think that Godot is God. But we don't know if Godot is God or not. We are only given these disturbing hints. Perhaps it was he came yesterday. I don't know, sir. Has he a beard, Mr. Godot? Yes, sir. Again, our idea of Christian God with a beard, a very masculine figure indeed. Fair or, or black? I think it's white, sir. Christ have mercy on us. He is using the expression us here. Okay. So he's talking about everybody in general. What am I to tell Mr. Godo, sir? Now pay attention. Tell him, tell him you saw me. He's not saying tell him you saw us. He is keeping Istragon out of this. Why? Because he knows that only one thief was saved. So in this small tiny moment, is he being selfish? Is he being self-centered? He hesitates. That you saw me. You're sure you saw me. You won't come and tell me tomorrow that you never saw me. That is the problem. Every time the boy comes, he doesn't recognize them. The boy kind of runs away. Vladimir stands motionless. Istragon wakes. Vladimir doesn't tell Istragon about the arrival of the boy. Istragon asks, what's wrong with you? Nothing. I'm going. So am I. Was I long asleep? I don't know. Where shall we go? Not far. Oh yes, let's go far f away from here. We can't. Why not? We have to come back tomorrow. What for? To wait for Godo. Ah, he didn't come? No. And now it's too late. So Vladimir is not clearly telling him how he has the information that Godo will not come today. He is only saying that Godo will not come. Yes, now it's night. And if we dropped him, if we dropped him, he'd punish us. Everything is dead but the tree. What is it? It's the tree. Yes, but what kind? Again, the cycle begins. And the cycle is not uniform or it's not identical. Their conversations are repetitive, but they are not, uh, you know, repeated in the same pattern, the topics keep on mixing and they keep on uh, changing sequence, you can say. So now they're talking about the tree and they're talking about hanging. Why don't we hang ourselves? With what? You haven't got a bit of rope? Again, they don't have rope. Istragon says, there's my belt. It's too short. You could hang on to my legs. And who would hang on to mine? As if... That's why he can't hang. True. Then Vladimir wants Istragon to give him the belt. Istragon has a cord tied to his waist and he takes it out. That cord is not strong at all. And they plan to bring a very strong rope next day. Just like the previous day they had the same plan. Didi? Yes. I can't go on like this. That's what you think. If we parted, that might be better for us. We'll hang ourselves tomorrow, unless Godo comes. And if he comes, 
will be saved. Vladimir again takes off his hat, does the same thing, puts it back. Well, shall we go? Pull on your trousers. Now, while taking off the cord, the trousers had fallen and the, this looks comic. So the spectacle is comic, the sentiment is tragic. That is what life is represented on stage by Beckett. You want me to pull off my trousers? Pull on your trousers. Then he realizes the trousers are you know, fallen on the ground and he pulls them up. Well, shall we go? Yes, let's go. Do they move? They do not move. And it ends. Act 2 repeats the same structure and events of Act 1, as I told you. But there are differences and variations. Now, just, just summarizing these differences, the tree is different. Lucky and Pozo have changed. Istragon is behaving in the beginning in a bit different way, less jovial manner. Uh, the boy, we don't know if the same boy or not. The boy says it's not the same boy. So we assume it's a different boy. So the idea of twins, the idea of 50% chance of salvation, the idea of life being a dream, all these ideas are all brought together in these pair of acts. Now the question we might have in our minds that has the situation of Istragon and Vladimir improved over time or has it become worse? Time which has lost its meaning over the course of this play is very sincerely maintained because both these acts take up almost the same amount of time on stage. They also take up the same amount of space when it comes to lines or pages in the book. So in matters of time and place, these two acts are identical. So in a way we can say that although there is a 50% chance of salvation, we see that in front of our eyes, we had two acts enacted and in neither of them, we see any kind of salvation. So this idea of 50% chance of being saved is also a myth which Beckett does away with. The questions which you should really prepare for your closer study is the symbols which are used by Beckett, the prominent themes, the idea of absurd as reflected in the play, a comparative study of the different characters, especially contrast between Istragon and Vladimir, and also a character sketch of Lucky and his relationship with Pozzo. If you want me to have a discussion session on these different topics, you can write down in the comment section and we can take that up someday. Thank you for being with me in this long, long video. I hope you have enjoyed it because I have certainly enjoyed every moment of it. My reading of Beckett is not a conclusive one. It is only intended to make you have interest in the topic so that you develop this urge to study independently and explore things which even I might have missed. Write down in the comment section anything that comes to your mind and stay subscribed for more videos like this. This is Monami Mukherjee signing off. Till our next video, stay happy, stay subscribed.